Our eighth speaker of the evening is an award-winning journalist, having written for publications like Avenue Magazine and the Calgary Journal. Uh, as an artistic associate for Inside Out Theatre, she's working to help improve accessibility and inclusivity in Calgary's arts and theatre scene. Please put your hands together for Ashley King. didn't know already I can't see um, so disclaimer ow, I can't believe I have to follow those two acts um, disclaimer I'm not using any notes up here and I cannot see what's going on behind me so when I screw up if you guys don't want to watch it you can close your eyes and watch it from what I like to call my point of view <laughs> and unfortunately that's the only joke I have today um, oh, I have to Okay, so I'm legally blind, and I have been for the past seven years. My doctors tell me I have about 1% left of my vision. I can still take light in, but I can only really see blurry shapes and shadows and the contrast. I, when I look in front of me, I can't read, I can't write, I can't see detail, I can't see color, and of course, I can't drive. I see the static, like static off a TV screen, and it's in a sepia tone that I can't quite look past to see what's in front of me. Because I lost my vision in such a weird and unusual way, people often say to me, wow, Ashley, you're so strong. There's no way I could go blind and be okay with it. So, how does one go blind and become okay with it? I'm gonna tell you. But first, how I lost my vision. Back in 2011, I decided to do a backpacking trip and go to Australia. It was incredible. I got really cheap flights and decided to go to Bali in New Zealand for two months. While in Bali, I spent 35 days there, and it was amazing. But on my last night, I decided to go out for some drinks. No different from any night that I had gone out in the past. The next day, I flew to New Zealand. When I got there, I went to my hostel, and I went straight to bed. When I woke up the next morning, I noticed that it was dim. I didn't really know why, but I assumed it was poor lighting. When I got out of, the, out of my bed, I fell to the ground. I couldn't breathe. I dragged myself down to reception, gasping for air, and the receptionist knew that they needed to take me to the hospital. The receptionist grabbed my wallet, which was at the time was this colorful pouch that you see. But when I looked down at the pouch, I couldn't see any color. It was dull and there was no color. I knew something was wrong. By the time I got to the hospital, I was completely in the dark blind. I could just barely see my hand cross in front of my face and just the shadow tips of my fingers. Doctors didn't know what was wrong with me, so they took my blood. And when they got my blood back, they asked me, Ashley, do you know why there's a large amount of methanol in your system? For those of you who don't know what methanol is, it's a harmful chemical that comes out in the distillation of alcohol. It's meant to be removed. If it's not removed, con congesting it can kill you, or in my case, it can make you go blind. In Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries, to cut costs, they make their own alcohol or they buy from the black market. They then refill bottles that are familiar to Westerners and then serve these in hotels and in bars. On my last night in Bali, I unknowingly drank this. Meanwhile, back in Canada, my parents had received a phone call. The doctors had told them, your daughter has been poisoned. You need to get on the first flight to New Zealand because there's a very good chance she's not going to make it. I'm not a parent and I don't have a child, so I don't know what it's like to love a child. But all I can do is only imagine what my mom went through on that flight from Calgary to New Zealand, not knowing if I was going to be alive or dead when she landed. The methanol had turned my blood into an acid. It was basically embalming me from the inside out. And while they saved my life, the damage caused to my eyes was irreversible. When I woke up in ICU a few days later, I was blind and there was no cure. When the doctors told me this, all I could think, who would ever love someone that's blind? How would I ever go to university? How would I ever travel? How would I have a career? I was devastated. When I finally returned back to Canada, the devastation and the depression I felt was insurmountable and only increased. I was a horrible person to be around for, for the first few years. I was in denial, constantly telling people that I was gonna get my vision back or that I just wasn't wearing my contacts. I was angry, lashing out on people all the time, telling them that they didn't deserve to see. I considered suicide more times than I would like to admit. But I always reminded myself that that would only be putting the pain that I felt onto somebody else. 
We don't get to choose what happens to us in life, but we do get to choose how we decide to live that life. I could either lay down and die and give up, or I could fight. Death is easy, life is hard. I decided to take my life back. While I was still in denial about my, what had happened to me, I didn't really want to share my story. But the fact was, this was happening and people didn't know about it. I knew I had to go to the media and say what was going on. This also made me consider a career path in journalism, to which I later enrolled in the Emory U Journalism program. I was finally on a path to finally accepting what had happened to me. A few years later, I really wanted to travel, but I was terrified. The last time I'd done it, I'd nearly died and barely escaped what little vision I had left. I questioned what I was capable of, but thankfully, my best friend didn't. So, we decided to backpack through Central America, seven countries, three weeks, and we did it. A few years later, I got another opportunity to do an exchange in England. And while I was absolutely terrified to navigate myself around an entirely new country, I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> I was taught by incredible journalists, I made lifelong friendships, and I fell in love with somebody who to this day still loves me and my beautiful broken eyes. Earlier this year, I got another opportunity to travel to India on a field school with MRU. But the thing that was most surprising to me while on this trip, it was incredible. But seven years ago when I lost my vision, all I could do was think about going to India because India was the only place in the world where doctors were working on a cure to bring back eyesight to methanol poison victims. But this past spring when I was there, it didn't even cross my mind. I had the email of the doctor that I had been in contact with seven years ago, but I decided not to reach out. Because for once, my vision, or the lack thereof, was not my only concern. I was gonna be okay. I used to think that time heals everything, but what I've come to realize, it's not time, but what you do with that time that heals you. Yes, it's been hard, and yes, I cry, and yes, there's days where I wish it didn't happen to me, but those days get further and further apart. So when people ask, how do you do it? What's your secret? There is no secret. There is no right or wrong way to getting over an insurmountable trial of this magnitude. It's just one day at a time, one foot in front of the other. We as humans are strong, much stronger than we give ourselves credit for. We're resilient, and we put up with a lot. So if there's one thing that I can ask that you take away from this tonight, is that you share my story, and you tell people about what's happening in Bali and in Southeast Asia, because I would hate for this to happen to any of you or someone that you love. But if this was to happen to you, I have confidence that you are strong and capable and adaptable and resilient, and then in time you too would also be okay. Thank you.